Welcome, Biology 182 lab students. Today we'll be discussing Lab 39, Phylum Arthropoda, which is found on page 425 in your lab text. Looking at the first slide, we can see many examples in this phylum. In the top left is a species of rhinoceros beetle. Some of the largest arthropods are in the rhinoceros beetle family. In the top middle we can see a crustacean, which is a crayfish. In the top right we see a luna moth, so moths and butterflies are included in arthropoda. In the left middle we see a leopard moth. In the middle picture we see a desert hairy scorpion, which is found here in Arizona. In the middle right we see centipedes. Centipedes and millipedes are included in the arthropod group. In the bottom left we see a dune beetle. We can find these here in Flagstaff, buzzing around lights on the east side. In the bottom left middle we can see a mosquito. So flies and bees are included in arthropoda. Next to that we see another rhinoceros beetle. And in the bottom right we see a butterfly. Your objectives before this lab to learn are number one, describe the structures that contribute significantly to the survival of arthropods in their environments. Number two, describe the general morphology of organisms of phylum arthropoda. Number three, list characteristics that arthropods share with the phyla discussed previously. Number four, discuss those characteristics of arthropods that are newly derived from those of their ancestral phyla. Number five, list examples of the major classes of arthropods. And number six, describe modifications of the exoskeleton and paired appendages of arthropods. In summary, the arthropods are the most diverse phylum of animals with insects compromising the majority of this richness. As their name implies, these dioecious invertebrates have jointed appendages, one of the six adaptations that contribute to the success of this lineage. A hardened exoskeleton, tagmata, specialized respiratory and sensory structures, and the metamorphic lifestyle are presumably responsible. Insects are the only winged arthropods, and this trait has likely led to the immense diversification of these land-dwelling animals, of which there are nearly one million described species and counting. Many arthropods lay eggs, however some are viviparous. Their lineage is monophyletic and likely sister group to the onychophorans, the velvet worms, or tardigrata, which are the water bears. The last of the trilobites, which is an arthropod, in the mass extinction at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago. Uh, they are the most diverse group of animal species preserved in the fossil record, not just presently, consisting of nine or possibly ten orders and over 15,000 describes fossilized species. The monophyletic uh, history of arthropods is a continuing debate. A closed circulatory system separates the annelids from arthropods, despite similarities arising from segmentation. Most recent molecular evidence suggests that annelids and mollusks are much closerly related to one another than, than arthropods. Onychophorans and tardigrades are thought to be the best candidates for sister taxa, but both groups exhibit open circulation as well as metamorphism or segmentation. So, what are the ancestors of arthropods? Well, the two best candidates are the phylum tardigrata, or the water bears, and phylum onychophora, which are the velvet worms. Tardigrades, commonly known as water bears or moss piglets, are small, water-dwelling, segmented animals with eight legs. They are notable for being one of the most complex of all known polyextremophiles. An extremophile is an organism that can thrive in a physically or geochemically extreme condition that would be detrimental to most life on Earth. Polyextremophile, such as the tardigrade, is capable of thriving in a variety of extreme conditions, any one of which would be detrimental to life on Earth. Tardigrades can withstand temperatures just above absolute zero to well above the boiling point of water. They can survive pressures greater than any found in the deep, deepest ocean trenches and have lived through the vacuum of outer space. 
They can survive solar radiation, gamma radiation, ionic radiation, hundreds of times higher doses that would kill a person. They can go without food or water for nearly 10 years, drying out to the point where they are 3% or less water, only to rehydrate, forage, and reproduce. Usually tardigrades are one millimeter long. They're short and plump, four pairs of legs, with four to eight claws, also known as discs. The animals are prevalent in moss and lichen, when collected, may be viewed under a very low power microscope, making them accessible to pretty much everyone. Velvet worms, the Anichphorans, literally claw bearers, are a minor group with only about 180 species. These obscurely segmented organisms have tiny eyes, antenna, multiple pairs of legs, and slime glands. They have variously been compared to worms with legs, caterpillars, and slugs. They are most common in tropical regions in the southern hemisphere where they prey on smaller animals such as insects which they catch by squirting an adhesive mucus. In modern zoology, they are particularly renowned for their curious mating behavior and for bearing live young. Today's phylum is phylum arthropoda. Today we'll be learning about four subphyla and six classes. The first subphylum is subphylum Chalicerata. This subphylum has two classes, class Meristomata, uh, a common name, the horseshoe crabs, and class Arachnida, so spiders, scorpions, mites. The second subphylum you'll be learning about today is subphylum Crustacea. The one class you'll need to know is Malacostraca. These are crabs, crayfish, and shrimp. The third subphylum is Myriapoda. This means many-footed organisms. The two classes you'll be learning about are class Chylopoda, or the centipedes, and class Diplopoda, or the millipedes. And our last subphylum is subphylum Hexapoda, which consists of class Insecta, or insects. Looking at a beautiful pie graph of the known organisms on this planet, this is a pie graph of the biodiversity of the known organisms. Looking at it, what is the largest group that compromises most of the biodiversity that is known? Of course, it's the arthropods. Take a look at the insects as a class within arthropoda. A huge majority of the known species on this planet are insects and arthropods. Chordates compromise a very low amount. Uh, protists, very small. Monarins and viruses, which include viruses here based on genetic information. Keep in mind they are not counted as an organism. Uh, fungus has quite a few species, but nowhere near the insects. Algae has quite a few, but vascular plants, there are quite a few known. Now, with this pie graph, this represents known species. Why would you imagine that monarins and protists are not nearly well discovered. Well, of course, they require equipment, typically, to view. And insects, typically being a macroorganism, don't require equipment, just a book to key them out. So keep in mind there's a technology aspect, a limitation to this knowledge, but it does represent uh, the biodiversity that is known. Looking at the ancestral traits of arthropods, well, we know that they're eukaryotic. They possess a nucleus in their cell. They possess movement, true tissues, organs, and organ systems. Bilateral symmetry. They are triploblastic, which means they have three cell layers in development, and a true coelom. But this coelom is derived from cell masses, not from a digestive tube. They share many ancestral traits with mollusks and annelids, especially open circulation. Looking at our phylogenetic tree, we'll start at the bottom, as always. The ancestral colonial coanoflagellate gave rise to two groups, parazoans with no true tissues, the sponges, eumetazoans that do have true tissues, and that group gave rise to radiata, which are the jellies and comb jellies, and they have radial symmetry, they're diploblastic, and then bilateria. They have bilateral symmetry, and they are triploblastic. Then that gave rise to two groups, the acelomates, with no body cavity. Those are the platyhelminth words. And then ones with true body cavities. 
And then that gave rise to two groups, the pseudocelomates. That's a body cavity not enclosed by the mesoderm. That's rotifers and nematodes. And then true coelomates, body cavity enclosed by a mesoderm. And there are three groups. The protostomes, a coelom derived from cell masses, the locophorates, and the deuterostomes, which we'll be discussing later. Protostome difference from the deuterostome difference is uh, protostomes have a coelom that derives from cell masses, and deuterostomes have a coelom that derive from a digestive tube. The phylum arthropoda, which means jointed foot, have really many traits that help them succeed. One is a hardened exoskeleton, composed of a protein called sclerotin and calcium carbonate. The great thing about having an exoskeleton is it can be molted, and then rapid growth, and then molted again. Uh, this deters water loss and is for protection from predators, parasites, and pathogens. They have jointed appendages, provide sites for muscle attachments. Uh, so the inside of the exoskeleton provides site for muscle attachment and the joints themselves. So if you have a joint, now we have a lever system, and that provides more strength. So the more joints, the more muscles, the better the lever system. And that's used for locomotion, crawling, flying, uh, being quick, uh, burrowing, swimming, everything that arthropods do. They have specialized appendages. So in feeding, they can have chelicerae, labial palps, etc. For sensing the environment, they can have antennae and legs to sense vibration. Reproduction, they use pedipalps and swimmerets and ovipositors. In defense, they can have pinchers, which are all known, also known as chelae. The exoskeleton of arthropods varies in thickness, from a very strong shell of a crab, interlaced with strong chains of calcium carbonate, to the delicate exoskeleton of a dragonfly. There is a limit, however, to the volume of an arthropod. That's why we don't see arthropods the size of, say, a wolf, because the exoskeleton has to be very, very thick in order to keep the pressure of the coelom intact. Now, what this means is, as you know from the surface area to volume ratio, uh, volume as you get larger, has decreased surface area. This means less places for muscle attachment if an arthropod were to be giant, like a wolf. Further looking at traits that make arthropods successful, one is the tagmata, or body regions. Those are fused body segments into macro sections, such as head, thorax, and abdomen. And then this increases the flexibility of the body, but at the same time provides the exoskeleton enough surface area to protect the organism. They have sensory structures. So light-sensing eyes are called ocelli, and compound eyes are many ocelli with multiple lenses. If we look up to our top right, we can see a dipterin, a fly with its compound eyes, the wonderful thing about these compound eyes is there are literally thousands of these compound eyes, and each ocelli produces an image, and then those images are combined in the insect brain to make a 360 degree view around the organism nearly as good as our eyes. They have antennae. And antennae can be used for vibration, not only through land, but also through air and water. They're used for touch, of course, to find things, especially in the dark. That's why many cave insects have very long antennae. And they sense odor, so they're covered in chemoreceptors, ready to pick up chemicals. And it's a wonderful thing they have, too, because now they smell in stereo. These organisms lay eggs, except a few that are viviparous, and those eggs protect, protect developing embryos. They're less energy to make from the parent. So in groups of organisms that either have live birth or have egg laying, 
There's two strategists. One, the R strategist, lays a lot of eggs and exhibits very little parental care, if any. And the K strategist is an organism who has few offspring, but spends a great deal of energy raising that organism to make sure that offspring, to make sure that they survive. So these eggs don't cost much from the parent to make. And when we say eggs, don't confuse these eggs with gametes. So a female gamete is an unfertilized egg and then a fertilized egg. I always like to say unfertilized egg or fertilized egg. That really differentiates for me. And of course, there's an exception. Scorpions and aphids have live birth. Some have internal fertilization, so they're dioecious. There's a male and female insect, and they have sex. Or they have external fertilization. So the eggs are fertilized by males. Now, some work, so the males drop spermatophores, and then the female finds it with her chemoreceptors on her antennae, and pick it up. Before I begin, I should mention there are some noises coming from behind me. That's Mr. Pippin's chewing on a bone that I gave him. So it's not my stomach or anything, it's just Mr. Pippin's doing his thing. Right, Mr. Pippin's, you're still with us, right? He said that we should continue on with tagmosis. So we know what tagmata are. Those are fused, fused segments in arthropods. But they're specialized. The basic schematic for insects is there's a head. And the head includes sensory structures and mouth parts. So we're going to find our chemoreceptors. We're going to find our photoreceptors in this area. And, th and so on. The thorax. Well, that's uh, typically where a lot of muscles attach. And if you can look at our ant here, you can see that the legs come from the thorax. And for that reason, there are many muscles in the thorax. And we call that sometimes the muscle box. And of course, winged insects have their wings, typically coming from the thorax. And then we have the abdomen. And that's where we're going to find our GI tracts, our reproductive organs, and so forth. So remember that tagmata are unique in each subphylum. And what is tagmosis? Well, it's a morphological toolkit allowing diverse forms to arise from similar structures. So keep in mind, arthropods have a similar blastula, and the cells can divide in multiple different ways, giving rise to different tagmata, and thus creating organisms that have unique tagmata for the environment that they live in. Let's discuss Chelicerata, which means the horned ones. In Chelicerata, they only have two tagmata. The head and the thorax is combined into a cephalothorax. And then they have an, an abdomen. So two tagmata. There are two modified appendages. First are chelicerae, which are pinchers or fangs. And those are mouth parts for feeding or tearing that excrete venom in spiders. And pedipalps. And those are little arms, typically near the mouth, for capturing prey, they use them for vibration sensing and copulation. And they typically have four pairs of walking legs. So four pair, eight legs, as we know the spiders to be. And they do not possess antennae. The pedipalps seem to be the replacement for antennae. In our pictures, we can see to the top right, we can see a nice orb-weaving spider with a good example of a cephalothorax and an abdomen. In the bottom right, we can see a spider with its uh, chelicerae highlighted green, and those red dots are its eyes. And then if we look, uh, we can see those first appendages coming out are pedipalps. And many spiders have very long pedipalps, but typically are not the main movers in locomotion. The first class we're going to discuss in the subphylum Chelicerata is the Meristomata. These are the horseshoe crabs. And Meristomates refer, refer to a partial opening. One thing to note with these organisms, they have many pairs of eyes. So on the dorsal side, they have two compound eyes and then two cellae. 
In the ventral side, they have five ocelli. The tail has an ocellus, and the body has six scattered ocelli around, which means these organisms can see a 360-degree view, despite their odd shape, and the brain will put together those images to form that bubble view of their environment. These organisms are living fossils. Uh, they've been around since the Devonian period, 400 million years ago. In the bottom left picture, we can see a fossil of a horseshoe crab. Who cares about the horseshoe crabs? Well, they provide a valuable service to us as humans. Blood from the horseshoe crab, Limulus, polyphemus, is more valuable than you might think. It annually accounts for product and testing worth 50 to 60 million dollars to the medical industry. Amoebocytes circulating in the blood show an ancient immune response by releasing coagulogen from granules in the cells in response to bacterial toxins. This reaction forms a clot around the site of invading bacteria. The medical industry catches the crabs, bleeds about one-third of the, their blood, and then releases them. Mortality is about 7.5 to 10%. The limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL, is extracted from the blood, marketed, and used to detect any entrance of gram-negative bacterial endotoxin present in the newly factured equipment, needles, vaccines, prosthetic limbs, or even blood samples from the patients. As required by the FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration, injectable drugs and vaccines must pass the limulus test with LAL before they are approved. There is no syn synthetic substitute for LAL, so conservation and management of the horseshoe crab populations is critical and may save your life. Take a look at the uh, bottom left, we have a video on molting, and then in the right we have a group mating video. So they'll mate in these very large groups on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And then in the top left picture, we can see those two compound eyes on the dorsal side and the segmentation of the organism. Further looking at meristomates, the horseshoe crabs, as we mentioned, they're ancient, but they are typically marine. They're a semi-aquatic arthropod, but they do come out onto land to breed. There are only four living species. And as I mentioned, they're abundant in the Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico. They have a very hard carapace. It's a shell covering the cephalothorax, which we mentioned is the tagmata. And they, of course, have two tagmata, just the same as uh, other groups within the subphylum chelicerata. They have a cephalothorax and an abdomen. And then they have a telson, uh, and that's another name for a tail. And here's some appendages they have. They have book gills. Uh, somewhat like the book lungs within spiders, and that's for gas exchange. They have pedipalps, so tiny arms near the mouth for examining food and smelling. They have chelicerae, they do have pinchers, um, however, are considered harmless. And then the telson itself is a very large lever system for flipping themselves over if they get flipped under their back. So in the top right picture, we can see they have a carapace, abdomen, and then the telson. And then the bottom right picture are the cute little larvae within the eggs, which somewhat look like the adults. One thing to note is they have blue blood. They have magnesium as their oxygen-carrying atom rather than our iron, and oxidized magnesium turns blue. Also within Gelizerata, there is another class, the arachnids. Those are the spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites. In the top left, we can see a deer tick which are common around here and are ectoparasites of humans, deer, and dogs, and other mammals. In the top right picture we can see a large tarantula, or bird spider, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with from movies and pet stores. In the bottom left is the emperor scorpion, or king scorpion, which is from West Africa, the largest scorpion. In the middle we can see a spider with its ocelli, and they have many of those to produce a 360 degree view. However, the jumping spiders, like the middle picture, those spiders have most of their ocelli, or compound eyes, in the front, as most predators have eyes in the front uh, to combine images to give better depth perception. Uh, in the bottom right, we have the familiar black widow. In, the, uh, in Arizona, we can see that red hourglass on the bottom of the abdomen that defines the black widow. 
There are many spiders around the house, such as the American house spider, that have this same sort of body plan or gestalt or shape as the black widow. Do not confuse the American house spider with the black widow. The American house spider does not have a red hourglass on the bottom of his abdomen and is not dangerous to humans. So please, if you find one of these spiders, you may escort it in a jar outside and be free of danger. Whereas a black widow, I feel better be safe than sorry. Uh, spiders have zero to four pairs of ocelli, up to eight total. And there's a wonderful video on fangs uh, to take a look at spider fangs. Further looking at the arachnids, uh, we can see that uh, in the top right picture is a scorpion. Scorpions are the oldest land arthropods known and are represented in the fossil record many millions of years ago. They have zero to four pairs of ocelli, as mentioned in the previous slide. And, of course, they have the two tegmana, cephalothorax and abdomen. The appendages, as we mentioned, have eight legs and one pair of pedipalps. And many have chelicerae that are modified as venomous fangs. Many spiders have spinnerets, which are silk glands on the abdomen that form webs. Uh, and we also know that spider silk is one of the strongest uh, materials, biomaterials, known to humans. And then they have Malpighian tubules. That's an excretory system of arachnids and insects. So the pedipalps are foot feelers. Um, some spiders lack eyes because they live in habitats where light is not available, like caves. So as I mentioned, there are cave crickets with very long antennae, and they are preyed upon by cave spiders. Malpighian tubules. Those are a system consisting of branching tubules extending from the alimentary canal that absorb solutes, water, and wastes from the surrounding hemolymph, which is known as their blood. The wastes then are released from the organism in the form of solid, solid nitrogenous compounds. The system, system is named after Marcello Malpighi, a 17th century anatomist. In the spider world, there are many silk types. Uh, one spider itself can produce many types of silk. So there are types of silk to make web, as we know. There are types of silk to surround prey. There are types of silk to make an egg mass. So if we look at our left picture, we can see a very large orb weaver spider that has caught a very small finch. Uh, There's a very large meal for this spider. However, it is possible some birds, such as the bee hummingbird, are not more than a couple of grams. Something to note about spider silk is it's stronger than steel in the three different applications of force. Stronger tensely, compressionally, and torsionally. Um, also, some silk, in the top right picture we can see, are covered in uh, sticky little beads of silk that can capture prey. Um, and then the bare threads that we're used to allow the spider to walk without getting stuck. So we'll have sticky in the center, and then on the outside we'll have the regular strands so the spider can walk through it. In the bottom right, uh, we can see an egg sac, and those egg sacs contain many different layers of silks. Sometimes spiders will protect their egg sac and leave it in a web, or sometimes they'll carry it around, such as wolf spiders found here in Flagstaff will carry their egg sac in their mouth on their cephalothorax. Moving on to a new subphylum, crustacea, which means hard shell. We can see many examples of crustaceans here. We can see in the top left a banded coral shrimp, which we can find in many aquaria from enthusiasts around the world. You can see the yeti crab, which many have many hair-like structures resembling a yeti, being a mythical creature that has blonde fur surrounding its body. In the top right picture we see a coconut crab that is able to crawl up coconut trees or date palms or fan palms quite easily. In the bottom left we have a very small crustacean called Daphnia, which is a beautiful swimmer if you can see it in a microscope. Barnacles are secretive crustaceans. They build a home and have a very hard shell that opens and typically are filter feeders. Like we can see in the uh, picture next to it with the uh, appendages coming out to filter feed. And then the bottom right picture is a osopod, commonly known as a roly-poly. You're familiar with uh, the 
potato bugs, as we commonly call them, uh, found underneath rocks around here, which is an isopod. But at the bottom of the ocean, there are very large isopods getting up to several inches, if not feet, in length. Millipedes are some of the only terrestrial arthropods to secrete a calcium carbonate shell, or isopods as well. Calcium carbonate, rather than sclerotin, is harder than most often found in crustacean shells, such as those excreted by barnacles. Cemented down on a rock, they filter feed with feathery appendages that evolved from legs once used for walking. Well, how do those little barnacles mate? They are hermaphrodites, and each has a penis several times the length of its body. So they have sessile copulation, so what will happen is they'll take their penis to the mate next to them. Subphylum crustacea, class Malacostraca, are the crayfish, crabs, and shrimps. They get their name from the terms malacos, which means soft shell, and ostracus, or shelled body. We see that mostly the marine are freshwater. However, there are a few that come out onto land, such as crabs, like the hermit crab. But little known, uh, the hermit crab starts its life out in a marine habitat and then has to go through somewhat of lung development to come out onto land. Uh, their appendages are biramous, which means they're forked. So uh, the insects have uh, uniramous appendages, whereas the crustaceans have biramous. They have two pairs of antennae on their head. They have appendages known as swimmerets, and they can be used in sperm transfer, transfer in males, in carrying eggs, in females, and sometimes males. They have chilipeds. So the first walking legs are pinchers. And then they have five pairs of walking legs. They can have two or three tagmata. They can have a head, thorax, and abdomen, or sometimes a cephalothorax and a segmented abdomen. They have compound eyes with many lenses. Uh, gills for respiration, and those are attached to legs, which uh, allows the legs to flutter and then gain more oxygen by fluttering back and forth in the medium which they're breathing in. And then a carapace. There's a shell on lobsters and crayfish. And as we mentioned, that's sclerotin fused with calcium carbonate that uh, makes for a very hard exoskeleton. In the top right, we see a picture of an amphipod. They're typically very small. Uh, we can see them quite well in microscopes. In the middle right, we can see a crayfish there and its cephalothorax and segmented abdomen. And in the bottom right, we see krill, which uh, are very small, swim, sometimes swim in very large schools, and are eaten by blue whales. We can see an example of their swimmerets there on their body. One of the objectives for this lab is to dissect a crayfish. So let's get familiar with the internal anatomy of a crayfish so that you'll know what you'll be doing for class. Uh, starting at the top left, we have something called an encephalon, which is known as the brain in quotes. However, a crayfish has many ganglion running along the ventral nerve cord. Each ganglion is capable of producing motor impul impulses so the animal can swim. Uh, so what that means is even if you cut off the head of a crayfish and supply stimulus to those ganglion, the organism can swim. Now looking at the stomach, uh, the stomach is very large, as you can see, and has a very large digestive gland next to it. And that digestive gland secretes many enzymes that help digest their food. We have a heart on the dorsal side that pumps their hemolymph throughout their body. We have the gonad, and they typically sit above the stomach and intestine. And you can see that long intestine there that's like a tube. Something interesting about that intestine is that it is pressurized in a great deal so that it is a very hard, rigid tube. And that allows for extensor and flexor muscles to attach to, as well as the exoskeleton for muscle contraction and movement. You can see the anus at the back there. And uh, now let's move on to the mouth. So we can see the mouth there, and behind it is a, uh, a an esophagus. And the mandible is what helps break those pieces of food up into the mouth, and then put into the esophagus. We also have an appendage, uh, it's called a maxilloped, which is also for food preparation. And the green gland, uh, it's a very large gland, 
and it's much like a kidney, so it's going to filter waste in the human lymph. And then, of course, we have a compound eye. Subphylum myriapoda. They are traditionally found in terrestrial habitats. They can have two or three tegmata, so the insects will have a head, thorax, and abdomen, but sometimes we'll see just a head and a segmented trunk. They have one pair of antennae, and appendages are unira uniramous, which means they're unbranched, uh, like, unlike the pinchers we found in crustacea. They have trachea and spiracles. Those are passive vessels for gas exchange. And spiracles are openings that can open and close to the trachea. In the top right, we can see a centipede there, and noticing that they are uniramous appendages. So they're not branched like crustaceans. Uh, to the middle, we see a housed centipede, which can get very long, uh, up to uh, an inch or more in length. And then in the bottom right, we can see a fly. And then next to it, we see a millipede. Again, noticing that they are unbranched appendages, but we see two uh, appendages coming out of each, quote, segment, which are fused segments. And we'll get to that in a little while. Looking at class Chilopoda, or Chilopoda, which means one foot, are the centipedes. Uh, something interesting about the right picture is a female protecting her babies. So they'll lay eggs, 15 to 16 number, and laid in a nest in a soil of rotten wood. Female stays with the eggs, guarding and licking them to protect them from fungus. The female in some species stays with the young after they have hatched, guarding them until they're ready to leave. If disturbed, the female will either abandon the eggs or eat them. Abandoned eggs tend to fall prey to fungus rapidly. In the top left picture, we can see a hooked back pair of legs. Many people are afraid that those are the fangs, but in the bottom left picture, we actually see the fangs on the head of the organism next to the antennae. Most centipedes have venom, somewhat like spiders, and they can bite humans, but are typically not dangerous. The red-headed centipede in the center there is one of those examples that also can bite. Some centipedes have small poison glands on the tips of their feet, so if they walk on a human, they can sometimes leave little red welts for every footstep that they have, and can be quite annoying to the victim that fell to the centipede walking on them. Further looking at Chilopoda, uh, centipede's a common name means, quote, 100 feet, although many of them have few or more than 100. We can find them in soil, under logs, or stones, typically in areas that are protected and somewhat humid. They're carnivorous, so they're active predators, and they mostly eat invertebrates like spiders. They have two tagmata, a head and a segmented trunk. Of course, they're uniramous with their appendages, so they have one pair of legs per segment, and they have something called forcupules, which are venom fangs, and they only have one pair of antennae. They do have a celly on their head. Those are a simple light-sensing eye, and they're typically dorsoventrally flattened although many of them are fusiform in shape, which refers they look somewhat like a cylinder. What centipedes actually eat is not well known because of their cryptic lifestyle style and thorough mastication of food, which means they chew it up really well and we can't see it in their gut. Laboratory feeding trials support that they will feed as generalists, taking most anything that is soft-bodied and reasonable in the size range. No copulation. Uh, centipede reproduction does not involve copulation. Males deposit a spermatophore for the female to take up. In one clade, the spermatophore is deposited into a web, and the male undertakes a courtship dance to encourage the female to engulf his sperm. In other cases, the males just leave them around for females to find. Kind of like finding a treasure. I wonder how Terence and Philip would feel about it. Now looking at class Diplopoda, which have two feet per segment, in quotes. Millipede, of course, means a thousand feet, but of course not really. Uh, we notice that they are detritus eaters, so they'll eat dead and decaying plant matter. So we'll find them quite frequently under rocks around many decaying leaves. In the top left picture, we can see that they have grouped acelli, or eye cells. 
In the top right, uh, that shows a giant millipede. And remember that they are not active predators, so they don't bite, uh, typically detritivores or herbivores. And they have usually between 50 and 150 leg pairs. Uh, looking at the bottom left, we can see their uh, wonderful habitat, uh, a network of little burrows that they go into and then come out to munch on the detritus or leaves. And then their defense, uh, they curl up into a vortex or spiral, thus protecting their soft parts that are underneath on their ventral side. They're typically active at night and spend most of their life in moist soil and decaying vegetation. Most of millipedes are nature's recyclers, as they eat decaying leaves and other dead plant matter. Further looking at the diplopodes, or millipedes, as we mentioned, they are nocturnal herbivores eating detritus, but some eat live plant matter, such as the top right picture. They have two tagmata, a head and segmented trunk. Uh, we can see that clearly in the top right and bottom right picture. They have uniramous appendages, so those are two pairs of legs per segment, and segment is in quotes, because it's actually two fused segments. So it appears as one, but was exact, actually two in development. They have one pair of antennae. They have cylindrical or fusiform bodies in cross-section, as opposed to the dorso-ventrally flattened bodies of the centipedes. They have odoriferous glands. And these release a toxic repellent over their bodies for defense. Those glands can secrete... Uh, poisonous liquid, or hydrogen cyanide gas through microscopic, microscopic pores, and those are the odoriferous glands along the sides of their bodies as a secondary defense, their first being curling up into a tight co coil to protect their soft underbodies. Some of these substances are caustic and can burn the exoskeleton of ants and other insect predators in the skin and eyes of larger predators. Um, animals such as the capuchin monkeys, have been observed intentionally irritating millipedes in order to rub the chemicals on themselves to repel mosquitoes. And of course they have grouped acelli, we can see that quite well in our top right picture, which are simple eyes clustered on the head. Subphylum Hexapoda class Insecta. These are the first organisms to fly and most have two pairs of wings that are attached to the thorax when they're adults. Here you can see a few examples. Class Insecta, then, has six legs. If you remember, their subphylum is Hexapoda, so the six-footed organisms. They have wings, which are actually outgrowths of their exoskeleton off of that thorax. Uh, you see compound eyes and or ocelli. So ocelli are light-sensing structures where compound eyes have multiple lenses. They have specialized mouth parts, one pair of antennae, and they have three distinct tagmata, the head, thorax, and abdomen, and they have two kinds of metamorphosis. Looking at complete metamorphosis, we start out uh, pretty simple as an egg that hatches into a larva, and then a larva that uh, makes a pupa or cocoon, and then out pops an adult from that cocoon, which you're familiar with, I'm sure, from looking at caterpillars and butterflies. Uh, the metamorphosis. In the cocoon, the body of the larvae develops into an adult. There's a chemical breakdown in the larva body. It literally liquefies. And then there's new cell formation and recombination. So if you should open up a cocoon in the middle of the metamorphosis, you will just find something looks like cellular jelly. Um, this prevents resource competition between juveniles and adults. So juveniles typically will eat plant matter, uh, such as leaves, and then adults will eat nectar from flowers. And they live in completely different habitats. So uh, these caterpillars will be living um, in the canopy of trees, whereas the adult uh, is uh, flighted and can move from flower to flower, living typically down... Uh, where there are blooming flowers on the floor of a forest or desert. Um, an example you find, complete metamorphosis, are in beetles. So instead of caterpillars, we find beetles have grubs. Flies uh, typically refer to their larvae as maggots, butterflies or caterpillars. Ants are pupa, and bees are also known as pupa. In the top right picture, we can see quite a lovely caterpillar there. Uh, what appears to be a swallowtail butterfly. In the uh, middle right, we can see a picture of what appears to be a monarch, 
that is uh, just about ready to hatch. In the bottom right, we see an adult morpho butterfly, as mentioned before. And then, the bottom picture, there is an actual monarch caterpillar that is uh, building its cocoon and getting ready to metamorphose into an adult. Now that we've examined complete metamorphosis, let's compare that to incomplete metamorphosis. We have two life cycle stages. So we have a nymph, and then it turns into an adult. The nymph is wingless, and they look like their parents. These wings develop into pads, and then nymphs undergo several molts or instars before reaching maturity. We can see uh, the top right picture there, we have eggs, and then we have eggs that have hatched into a nymph, and then the nymph that develops into the adult. And they look very similar. Uh, juveniles and adults do share the same resources, typically consisting of the same diet. And the wings, when you see that, is a signal for the final molt. Um, and examples that in the insect world that have incomplete metamorphosis are crickets, cockroaches, stink bugs, and grasshoppers. Insects have diverse mouth appendages for eating a huge variety of food sources. In the top left we can see a beetle with very large mandibles that latch onto prey. So those mandibles are very strong lever systems and they are counter active, and when they latch onto it, then the small maxilla can begin to rip apart the organism for their consumption. They use their labial palps and maxillary palps to help those maxilla and put it into the labrum, or under the labrum, into the, the mouth itself and into the esophagus. In the bottom left we can see a housefly they have a completely different strategy. So they have a pad at the bottom of their labium. And that labium pad is for sponging up liquids. So it's a very porous material which allows uh, liquids to easily diffuse into them much like a paper towel absorbs spilled water quickly. We can see the labrum there and the maxillary palps, which are less for uh, feeding and more for sensory reception for the organism. In the top right, we can see a moth. So they use capillary action, or suction, to suck up uh, typically nectar from a flower. Although some moths have learned to drink from hummingbird feeders, as hummingbirds have. Um, I want you to know that hummingbirds do not use capillary action. They have a small forked tongue within their mouth that they use to pump nectar, whereas a moth does use capillary action. We can see that maxilla, which is you're familiar with, is very long, and it's typically coiled when not in use, but will be extended quite easily, um, like the trunk of an elephant, down into a flower's nectar chamber. We can see the labial and labial palp and labrum, which again are more for sensory and guiding that maxillae into the flower uh, nectar cavity. In the bottom right, we have a mosquito. And you can imagine that their mandibles are very sharp. So there are many tubes coming out of this mandible. And all of them are like a hypodermic needle. One is for injecting an anesthetic into your skin if you're being bitten by a mosquito. And this uh, also secretes a anticoagulant that thins the blood so you don't feel it and then the blood suddenly becomes very liquid, very viscous, and flows easily up the actual uh, feeding tube. So this is quite the operation when a mosquito bites its host. Uh, and the, the welt that's left over is typically a reaction to the anesthetics uh, that was injected into you so the mosquito could get its meal. There are some cases of mosquitoes becoming so abundant in northern Canada in the late summer that they can draw out more than a pint or a quart of blood from an animal such as a wapsie or an elk or a caribou. 
which actually can pose a problem uh, for the organism and uh, can be life-threatening to younger, smaller organisms. Insects were the first animals to fly. As they radiated onto land, they began to fly uh, quite after their beginning of their radiation. And there's only four groups of animals that evolved the flight ability. So we have invertebrates, the insects, and then the vertebrates, we only have birds, bats, and pterodactyls, or pterosaurs. What are those adaptive advantages? Well, of course, it's a good mechanism to escape predators. Um, as you know, uh, many birds evade uh, cats, and of course, many insects will fly away to avoid predatory insects, such as a praying mantis. Uh, in the beginning, when insects uh, first radiated, radiated on the land, vertebrates weren't far behind, and the amphibians uh, began to radiate onto land, and so the first real drive for insects to fly was to get away from these predators. Uh, they're used for food sca scavenging, of course. We know that uh, bees and uh, the hummingbird moth in the bottom right uh, use their flight uh, to find flowers to drink nectar. And then, of course, migration. In the bottom left, we can see that uh, the monarch butterfly does migrate, uh, typically all the way down into Mexico. And that's for a hospitable habitat to evade winter. So the onset of winter is what drive these monarch butterflies. Another species that does migrate is the painted lady butterfly, which sometimes will see a migration path through Flagstaff. In the top right, we see a beetle pollinating a poppy. And in fact, the first pollinators were not butterflies, but were actually beetles. Uh, check out our video on a monarch migration. You'll find that quite interesting. Many insects use camouflage to avoid predators and capture prey. You're familiar with this, of course. In the top left, we can see some organisms, uh, some insects can disguise themselves to look like flowers. So we have a flower-like praying mantis about to capture its prey, the unsuspecting butterfly. In the top right, and then one next to it in the middle, there are groups of insects called leaf bugs. And those leaf bugs, of course, look like leaves. We're familiar with katydids around Flagstaff that are an orthopteran, a grasshopper, that uh, has disguised to look like a leaf and quite well at it. In the bottom left, we see a bird feces butterfly. In the rainforest, there are many, many birds flying around, and bird feces are quite common, enough for uh, a moth to disguise itself, or a butterfly, as bird feces. In the bottom middle picture, we can see uh, a stick bug that we have here in Flagstaff, and they, of course, look like sticks or stems of plants. And then in the bottom right, we see a moth that fends off its predators by looking like an owl. So we can see those very large eyes of the owl, and we can see that represented in the uh, moth wings. Most people don't know that owls are typically very small. Uh, the great horned owl is an example of a very large owl, but many owls are only the size of your two fists put together, or even the size of one fist. And this butterfly, or moth, is a very large moth, and those eyes are about the same size as those small owl's eyes are. Insects were the first social animals, meaning that they do communicate with each other. An example of that is stridulation. Uh, that can be crickets and cicadas rubbing their wings or legs together and making sounds uh, for each other to hear. You're familiar with the cicadas and the katydids doing this. Um, they're likely the first organisms capable of producing and hearing sounds in a terrestrial environment. They also degree, secrete pheromones, which are chemicals that signal different things, like attracting a mate in moths and beetles. Bioluminescence. Uh, fireflies do not fly around just lighting up for our pleasure. No, it is a communication between other fireflies. They blink in a very particular way to attract a mate or declare their territory. Um, we have many insects that live in colonies and have a caste system, which means there's a hierarchy with 
queens, workers, soldiers, drones, pupae, and each one of those workers is di divided up into harvesters and caretakers of the pupa and caretakers of the queen. We see that in termites, ants, bees, and wasps. And, of course, many of them exhibit parental care. So, honeybees, in the bottom right picture, uh, we can see build galleries uh, and hives with many little tiny pockets for young to go in, and they're properly cared for, fed, and raised. Sometimes they'll do it in burrows, such as ants. And those protect and help raise those larvae. Of course, the queen can't do it herself. Her main job is to lay eggs, but the workers are the ones who actually take care uh, of that group. Many ask, um, how does a queen begin a new colony once she is born and flown away from her original hive? Well, she takes with her a group of workers with her to small, start a small hive. Um, so make sure that uh, you understand that we're talking about communication here using sound, we're using light, we're using chemicals to have insects communicate with each other. Parental care in insects isn't limited to social insects such as bees, ants, and termites. An interesting example of this are male and female carrion beetles that cooperate and prepare a meat nest and feed their young and protect their brood. So how it works is they'll dig a small hole and find some carrion nearby, such as a dead rodent seen in the bottom left-hand picture. And then what they'll do is they'll take pieces of meat from that carrion bring it to their hole and begin building a ball of meat in which the female will lay eggs and those eggs will hatch into pupae and the pupae will then begin eating the meat they've prepared for them. They exhibit a great deal of parental care and licking their young and making sure that they are clean and well fed. Other example uh, of parental care um, so brood and egg guarding, we see assassin bugs and stinking shield bugs do this. Um, male giant water bugs, uh, earwe earwigs and lace bugs, will carry eggs uh, on, their, on their backs. One thing that I want to make very clear about the difference between insects and bugs as the term, bugs, the proper bug, is in the order Hemiptera. Uh, so assassin bugs and stink bugs are in that order, but the rest of insecta should not be referred to as a bug unless it is in that one specific order of hemiptera. Of course, insects are important to human beings. It is more than a $20 billion a year industry, some of those which you're familiar with. So some people love honey, such as I do, from the honeybee. You see in the top uh, right picture is a honeybee collecting uh, nectar to make honey, but also pollinates crops uh, or wildflowers in that case. So people like to eat uh, insects, such as that top left picture, fried cicadas. Um, Drosophila is a small fruit fly, and that is studied uh, for its genetics and has been a very useful model in understanding how genes work. And in the bottom right, of course, is the silkworm, which the silk is harvested from them. So we see them in agriculture. Uh, we see cross-pollination of our crops and pest control. Um, so we can have ladybugs that are predators that eat aphids. While birds are perhaps the most visible predators of insects, insects themselves account for the vast majority of insect consumption. Without predators to keep them in check, insects can undergo an almost unstoppable population explosion. Uh, food. In some cultures, insects, especially deep-fried cicadas, are considered to be delicacies, while in other places they form a part of the normal diet as they have a high protein content for the mass. Uh, research. Of course, I mentioned the Drosophila play important roles. For example, because of its small size, short generation time, and high fecundity, the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, is a model organism for studies in genetics of higher eukaryotes. Because genetic systems are well, concerned, well conserved among eukaryotes, rather, 
Understanding basic cellular processes like DNA replication and transcription in fruit flies can help understand those processes in other eukaryotes, including humans. The genome of Drosophila melanogaster was sequenced in 2000 and reflecting the organism's important role in biological research. Looking at the ecological roles of insects, of course they're a major food source. Caterpillars and worms feed nestlings of birds. Aquatic larvae, such as dragonflies, feed fish. And adult insects feed lizards and amphibians. An interesting story, myself being from Salt Lake City, that I'll share with you, is in the late 1800s, when the Mormon pioneers first settled in the Salt Lake Valley, uh, they began growing crops. But they did not know that there was an insect called the Mormon cricket uh, that would devour crops. Now, what happened was, this was before the time of pesticides, the Mormon crickets would come in and wipe their crops clean, and they wouldn't have any yield to sell. One year, when it was at its worst, came a giant flock of the California seagull. Now, California gulls are found commonly in Utah, but this was a migratory flock. They came down, and they began eating the Mormon cricket. And this is why the California seagull is Utah's state bird. The story is even funnier to me in my studies of Native Americans. The Ute Indians at the time were watching the Mormon pioneers uh, become upset about their crops as they were lost because the Mormon cricket itself is a cooked delicacy. Uh, basically, they asked, what are you complaining about? You have a food source walking onto your land. Okay, back to ecological roles. Nutrient cycling. Um, of course, flies and beetles lay eggs and carrion and feces, upon which hatching consume the remains. Um, and they can also be for degrading and consuming leaf litter in the wood, seen in the bottom right, the leaf cutter ant. Uh, will go and cut the leaves, and then bring them back to their nest, and then grow a very specific fungus, which they uh, will grow crops of this fungus, which they can feed on. So take a look at that uh, video there, of leafcutter ants, and the fungi mutualism video. And then, of course, as we know, mutualistic relationships. F pollinating flowering plants. The plant gives a little bit of nectar, and a bee will help pollinate a plant. There, for seed dispersal, there's an interesting uh, orchid that will uh, deposit two very specific seeds onto a beetle's back after enticing the beetle with uh, a food smell. Of course, there isn't a food smell. And then, of course, insect and fungus, as we mentioned with the leafcutter ants. We can see to the middle right picture, there's a dung beetle that will collect uh, say, elephant dung, or elk dung, and then roll it uh, in an inverted position, which I find very comical as I see them rolling them across the streets. And then in the top right we see caddisfly larvae that build an interesting rock uh, fortress around their abdomen, in which feed fish. Of course, Arizona has many insects. Uh, we have about 15,000 species described in the state. Um, the estimates are actually two times that number. 95% of these are beneficial or harmless to humans. Um, there are diverse and diverse and varied habitat types and elevation ranges, sea level to 12,643 feet, which is the top of our um, San Francisco peak on Humphreys Peak. Um, and that leads to, of course, high insect diversity. Insects vitally important to the ecosystem, so if certain insect populations dec decline drastically, entire ecosystems could crash, uh, such as pollinators. Their decline affects uh, food webs from the bottom up because they, fa they found the base of many heterotrophic food webs. Some examples of insects we find here, in the top left we find a jewel beetle, in the top middle we find a weevil, in the top right we'll see uh, a caterpillar of a monarch butterfly, in the bottom left we'll see a white line sphinx moth, um, which behaves somewhat like, somewhat like a butterfly, uh, pollinating that uh, evening primrose there. In the middle, we see our pleasing fungus beetles, which are quite uh, brilliant blue with spots, sometimes with pink spots. In the bottom middle picture, we see a tiger beetle, which is a voracious predator, and 
typically can be seen running on sand. They have many different forms, from orange and black, like the tiger, to yellow and brown. In the bottom right, we see an underwing moth. So when these moths are frightened during the day, they will begin flying abruptly and show that bright red patch, often scaring away predator, predators. And in the uh, middle right, we see fritillary butterflies, which are commonly seen uh, on thistle drinking nectar and pollinating them with their feet. Here in Northern Arizona University, we do have a wonderful museum called the Colorado Plateau Museum of Arthropod Biodiversity. It's on the first floor of the biology building, and there's its website off to the right. Uh, you can see many things. Uh, down there, we can see um, the Grand Canyon Arthropod Monitoring Project. We can uh, look at a museum overview of what they have. And then there is a traveling arthropod show they'll put together for classrooms. There's many web links there on the website itself. There's project descriptions of what's going on. And then lots of databases of organisms you can look at to compare. Uh, the curator is Neil Cobb. Be sure uh, to go see that if you haven't been down there. I encourage you guys, every time that you find an insect that... Uh, you don't know what it is, please do not ask Kim Whitley. Just go figure it out yourself in the uh, Colorado Plateau Museum of Arthropod Biodiversity.